And we've got a great guest with you here today, today and that is Darlene. And Darlene, I do not want to mess up your last name. What's the cor correct pronunciation? It's like we met. We met. So that's easy. All right. We met. Darlene, yeah. we met. Well, Darlene Romet is a certified professional life coach, mental health advocate, and inspirational speaker. She is now happily married to the man she used to be unhappily married to. And together they share their life with three children. Darlene, as I told you before we started the show, I always like to let you, the guest, introduce yourself. So I'm going to let you shoot from here. Let all of our viewers and our listeners uh, know a little bit about you. Okay. Um, I struggled with depressions and um, all kinds of issues and um, like my whole life, even as a child. And um, when I was married about, I got married when I was 30, I was married about 12 or 13 years and it was getting really bad, like I just kept going into more and more depressions. And by that time I was on antidepressants and I couldn't, every time I got off the antidepressant, the antidepressants it would only be about um, 12, like another 12 months before I started going down again. And uh, I was so discouraged and I just felt like giving up, I was going to leave my family and one of my girlfriends talked me into getting help like one more time. So I, um, I went to an abuse specialist but that I thought that I was going to uh, like, well I was going to someone who was really good with dissociative identity disorder and that's what I thought was the problem, that I had been diagnosed with that when I was 26 and I never dealt with it. So I went to get this help and I found out that um, through a series of just conversations, I started to realize that all of my depressions had a root in what had happened to me as a child and that I believed because of the damage that was done to me that wasn't un, like that wasn't resolved, that wasn't taken care of, that I believed that I um, it was my fault because of things that were said to me, because of you know um, all kinds of things that I added put into this grid of I'm just not worthy, I'm not lovable, I'm not I'm not um, never going to be okay. And I started once I started to realize the root of what had happened and what I believed about myself, I was able to start to turn it around and come back to the truth about myself. And as I and you know it took a while, but as I worked through all this stuff and looked at it and looked at what did this make me believe about myself, this event, I had been sexually abused, I had been hit, um, my mother had a really bad temper and and all these things that had happened, um, I believe, which I believed were my own fault, um, when I started to see the truth and look at them through a different grid, uh, the, I started to feel like I was coming alive. And when I, when, I was, when I felt like I had my life back, I developed a really big passion for um, telling other people. So I wanted to, I, I just knew I got to tell people because I knew so, so many self-help books that I had read about depression were not addressing this issue, you know, and I was like, I've got the answer. So I started speaking in, I was hired by a mental health firm to speak in seminars about, mostly about marriage abuse actually, but my part was about how I came out of this lifelong, you know, struggle with depression. And um, the people in the seminars were just like, every single person was just like, and I could see the lights going on and I thought, whoa, I've got something here, like everyone relates to me. And then I was getting mobbed on every break, you know, and and uh, I started like, oh man, I gotta, I've got to do something about this. So um, I, I went back, I didn't want to become a therapist because I was in my 40s and I didn't want to go back to school. I still had young kids, like now I should change my bio, I only have one child left at home. Uh, although we do share our lives still with our so three yeah, children. Your boss says you share them with three children. So I, I, yeah. Now that you haven't disowned the other two children yet. So. Yeah, that's right. They're just they're just yeah. not living at home anymore. But um, I, mean, I do want to thank you because you're, you're sharing as a survivor, and that always shows great strength and courage, which we greatly yeah. appreciate here at the Date Safe Project. So I just want to start by thanking you for sharing your strength and courage being a survivor yourself. Well, and thank you for this opportunity to be on the show. It's it's really great. My whole passion is is about reaching as many people as I can with this message. So, so when you, I, started, you started speaking out it sounds like at that point you caught the bug, uh, the speaking bug and realized you can make an impact. And yes. so where did you take it from there? You you knew that there was a group people out there that needed this. You knew yeah. you had a voice that connected with them. Where did it go from there? 
Okay, so I decided to go back to, to school, but I decided to get my coaching certification, and I did that online on a bridge line. Um, I chose a psychiatrist as my teacher because I wanted to learn how to do it without doing therapy because there's a real crossover in you can't do the crossover legally. It's not healthy at all. So well, I for took anybody my training. Listening, well, for anybody listening who understands what that's reference to, and that means that if, if you're up there speaking and acting as a counselor, every word you technically say could be legally liable uh, right. because you're giving advice. Same with a coach. If you're acting like you're a professional counselor, right. that legal liability you're putting at hand there, and it's very, it's highly... Uh, liable and it's unethical in many manners it must right. be perfectly correct in how they do it right so I, I, I then I was so I took this training with this psychiatrist and then who was a coach he was a coach he was a he was the dean of the of the school actually the coaching school so then he invited me to take a specialty training with him for a year and that was called live a new life story and it was more about like belief system stuff about like what do you what are your money beliefs and what are your those kind of things. But I very quickly put them through the grid of what I had learned and come out how I had come out of my fog and started realizing, oh, these are like what are my self esteem, you know, where did my self esteem get broken and what do I believe about myself because of what happened to me? And I did this I started journaling and I started writing for a couple of years. I kept speaking in the therapy company, but it it was so geared towards marriage and that wasn't my passion. So I took some internet courses because I knew that internet was the place to be. So to to get found, that's the new way of doing marketing, you know. So through that, I went to some um, kind of self like seminar well, kind I'm of. I'm going to pause if that's okay. I would like to ask. You said that he they were teaching it about money and life decisions. But you quickly realized you wanted to filter being a survivor through these words. Yes. And how that works. So if, I mean, if you don't mind, I'd like to jump into that because we have, okay. we have a lot of people who work with survivors. We have a lot of survivors who watch our show and listen in. Okay. What are strategies you learned that would help survivors create a new life design, as you mentioned, or a life story for themselves? Okay, well, what I've learned a lot because of um, my my website and all of the comments. I like I just That's what I did I took this training to learn how to do something on the web started my blog and started writing about what happened to me and how I saw it and basically I look at like and this is what I this is what I tell people um, the key to the present was in the past now we're living in a society that says forget it get over it you know it's not happening anymore you don't need to worry about that anymore it's past but I couldn't put it behind me until I actually validated it and looked at what had happened to me so what I tell people to do is look at the this is really hard like this is a hard it was hard for me to do to look at what happened to you and to say like that was wrong because I I remember saying well you know, like I must have done something because this guy came in my room when I was 13 and molested me. It was my mother's boyfriend and he molested me. But my mother said that I misunderstood his actions, which I didn't. But then she said, well, you did have a crush on him, Darlene. So I took that information that I had a crush on him. I realized I must, and she, another expression she used to say was, you must have done something. And, and that's very much like rape culture too, because yeah, you know, it's people will say. Blaming. I mean, you gave multiple sure. examples there of victim blaming, right? First, right. you had a crush on them, victim blaming. Yes. Uh, you must have misunderstood, victim blaming. Yes. Right? All of it. Now, when, and the thing about people will go, well, parent is loving, they're not victim blaming. Vict whether victim blaming is intentional or not, it's victim blaming. The consequences exactly. are they blame the victim. Exactly. And when people get upset if I say that, you know, I had to put the blame back where it belonged, I, I, I very clear blame is just a stepping stone for me. I don't. I don't have all that energy anymore about my parents or anything. They don't choose to have a relationship with me, but that's not that's a separate issue. You know, they don't want me talking about any of this. But I had to see like so I lived in this huge fear for years. What did I do to give them that message and is it going to happen again? So, you know, like taking that with all the other things in the grid of what we learned growing up. I had also been molested when I was uh, two and three years old by a babysitter. I had other history things that I thought, so I applied this, I must have done something to that issue from when I was two, 
And um, I thought, okay, I got, I've got to figure out what I'm doing to give this message. Well, then, you know, you grow up. I was totally a victim. I, I wanted attention. I wanted approval. And I got myself into trouble looking for it in the wrong places. But that was what I knew. So um, taking, like, that's what I did is I looked at that, all of the information from my past. Well, I didn't have to go through everything. It would have taken forever. But, like, I have clients that I only work with for two or three months and they're like, oh, they're free, you know. So, and some people just do it on right on my website. Right. They don't even, you, what you're really helping people do is get a release of the blame. Of, yes. Of like it's you said, it's putting it back in blame, putting the blame yeah. where it belongs, and then yeah. and you said a key thing there. Once you do put the blame where it belongs, freeing yourself so that you also right. don't live in anger for the rest of your life, which is right. understandable that somebody can be that angry, but it's not a way you want to live your life. It's not ideal. No. You want to be free of that. I couldn't believe how much energy that I had when I got through all this stuff. I had no idea how much it was bogging me down. And so even what's like, a step you would help a survivor? To, how would you, one, identify that it's not their fault, that the blame is the person who did it to them, it's the perpetrator, right. As what's a, what's another step they take in helping release that blame or redirect? Well, another big thing is looking at uh, is validating that it happened because so many even therapists will say like people go for help and they're told well we don't need to talk about the past it's what's bothering you today you know like the past is the past and that is so unhelpful so to say like validate what happened and validate that it was wrong because people are afraid to get angry anger is a great step in healing. You know, people are afraid to get angry. People are afraid to uh, say, like, I had a huge thing about gratitude. I thought I must be the most ungrateful because I practice gratitude, but it wasn't working. So I was like, I must be the most ungrateful person, and I'm, I must be so disappointing to God. All these things that were told to me that I had to learn to, um, like, to say, no, that's not true. It doesn't work that way. And so in the process of, looking at everything the way it was and looking at it through a truth grid instead of all the baggage of these false grids that and I mean you can't do it all at once and for um, anybody listening when you say a grid are you referencing for instance a frame of reference a perspective the yes a perspective okay yeah I like the grid word only because like I looked at things through such a false grid of understanding I had this like I really thought I had done something to deserve this. I did have a crush on that guy, on that man that came in my room. He was gorgeous. He was Italian. He was way younger than my mother. And I, he, I mean, I was 13. So I was like, oh, he's so cute. You know, my friends, talking to my friends about him. And then he molested me. And I was like, holy, like, is that all it takes is just to giggle about a man? And he takes that as a license to come and, come and do something inappropriate? You know, and, and so, and the only thing that saved me there was that my aunt had come in and she was visiting and she heard something and she came in my room and made him leave. I think I would have been raped. But the fact that she witnessed it, even though my mother denied it, that was a key thing. So I look for, I get people to look for little things that they can use for validation. Sometimes it's just somebody else like me as a coach saying that was wrong because I had gone to therapists and I said, you know, like my mom put her tongue in my mouth when I was nine. Is that normal? And the therapist would say, what do you think? Do you think it's normal? And the first, and I, I wouldn't tell them anything else after that. You know, I, I didn't know if it was normal. Maybe all mothers do that. You know, I had this inkling that it wasn't. So the first time I asked the, this and therapist. I need, that, I need to be fair just because we do, a lot of therapists do follow and we work with therapists around the country. So to be oh, fair. Oh, they're not all bad. No. But, Right, right, because it could sound like to somebody listening, all therapists go. Work oh no, no. Approach. And so I, now, I, I right. had traditional therapy to get out of this, the to come to my own, like to to recover. I had mm -hmm. a traditional therapist, so that I'm not trashing therapists. I'm just saying that I had had some bad sure. experiences. You know, and I don't, um, and I don't in any way want to take away your voice in sharing that. I just want to make sure for anybody listening, right, you're referencing these specific cases, right, right, right. And um, so when this therapist said to me, "Oh no, that is not right," like, and he kind of made this face, and I was like, "Oh, finally, I think I can talk to somebody," like you know. And then I told him about the sexual one sexual abuse, you know, 
and uh, I then I started to and you know like to heal because I finally was able to talk about it. I have permission. Well, you, just, you just said a key thing right there. You were finally able to talk. And, and too often in our society, people send this message out that survivors don't want to talk. And what that does for a lot of survivors who do want to talk is it makes them think, is there something wrong with me that I do want to talk? And everybody right. says survivors don't want to talk. And so I think it's really important that you as a survivor are sharing, I wanted to talk. Because one thing we tell audiences all the time is a lot of survivors want to talk. It's just the fear of how they're going to be treated if they talk. Exactly. And yeah, and I also, it's very important you're careful about who you talk to. Because sometimes, like, sometimes people are so afraid of the truth that that they don't want to hear that, that happened to you. They, they can't absorb that. And that is, that's okay. But because of the way we, for me, abusive situations and dysfunctional relationships were familiar to me. That was comfortable. I sought out more dysfunctional people to try to be heard and they shut me down. And so I was repeating this cycle over and over and over. And finally, I was able to talk about it and I got it all out and I started to heal. And I finally, I felt like I was, I had myself back for the first time. And I was a valid person in the world. I could validate anybody else. I could say to anybody, if someone had come and told me my story, but told me it was their story and I didn't recognize, you know, I would have said, oh my gosh, that's terrible. I'm so sorry that that happened to you. But I didn't see it for me. I didn't well, that's, that's all of us, really. That's all of us, right? Because... When it's us, we expect somehow that we're more brilliant, we're more intelligent, and we should have yeah. known better. Even though our friends could have all right. done that, not me. I should have known better. And that's true of all of us. That we just we have this expectation that I would not let this happen. Once again, right. the blaming. If I blame myself, then it's my fault. Like, and I I can own it, of course, sort of thing. Uh, and you're doing a great. You're sharing a great perspective, which is actually it's the opposite. When you release the self accountability and the blame, you can right. realize it wasn't your fault. You can now live. And I thought it was great. You said you had yourself back. It probably felt like you had yourself for the first time. Like I did, and I didn't even really know. I still don't really know how to articulate it. It was like I feel like me. Not that I ever felt like me before, but I right. feel like me now. And I do, and I feel that way every day. My goal when I started healing was to want to get out of bed in the morning. And I never thought it could be this good. I never thought it would be like, sometimes I'm like laying in bed trying to go to sleep and I've got so many things on my mind, I'm just so excited that I don't even want. I mean, you're, you're a classic uh, role model of the it gets better model. That, yes. You know, slogan that's been out there. And that, that slogan's been used for many different causes. Uh, you know, particularly in the past few years in relating to the GLBT, GLBT community. But yes. it also applies to a lot of survivors. It gets better. You know, as you become a survivor and become stronger, it gets better. Yeah. And, you know, you're absolutely reflecting that. Darlene, did you use other tactics in addition to speaking with therapists? Did you use strategies like, did you journal? Uh, did you write? What, what were other strategies you used? The develop everything I developed for my coaching program, my website and my Facebook page was what I developed. And it was through journaling and journaling and journaling and talking to some other survivors and we we gave each other feedback and it was I wrote down everything that worked. Every every well, as much as I could, every light bulb moment, like things that were like really, really impactful that like to me were like oh, I never thought of it that way because the whole thing for me is, and this is how I coach, is looking at it from a different perspective than that we've always learned to look at it because for me everything was a coping method. Every, All my dissociation, my depressions, my drinking, out, uh, binge eating and purging was all coping methods to escape the pain. And the thing that, and you know this expression also is all over the world, it's the pain is never as bad as we think it is. but I had to, to believe that before I was able to really look at the pain. So right. I was so you can't afraid. That until you're free of the pain, right? Exactly. But what I have found is that people will listen to other people that have been there. And I've always wanted to make a difference. I've always had that little, you know, oh, I want to be a, like, you know, a, I wanted to be like a speaker before I knew what, what like what I would speak about, you know, like because I had overcome alcohol and drug addiction when I was 23 as well. So 
Uh, like I, that's what I thought I was, you know. Right. Really you have all these life lessons to share with the world. That's right. By the way, Darlene, before we do get too far, what is your website? So anybody listening right now, if they're on their computers, they can actually go to your website and follow along. Okay, it's www.emergingfrombroken.com. So emerging is E M E R G I N G from broken, right? Emergingfrombroken.com. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, and you're doing speaking now, so if people want to bring you to their community, they can go to your website and find how to bring you to their community? Yeah, there's a contact page. Yeah, I don't speak as much as I used to, but I am available. If Most people want me to, they just want me to travel all over the place for nothing, like free, and I can't afford it, so sure. I have turned down some speaking engagements. No, I, and I think that's good for anybody listening to understand. If you want to bring somebody in to really help make a difference, Try to make sure that you're investing in making that happen, that you're putting together some financial resources to help make that happen for whoever you're bringing in. It's always a good lesson. Uh, are you on social media? If people want to follow you, for instance, do you yes. do Twitter, do you do Facebook? I'm on Twitter. I, I've, re I've run out of time so much, but I have an EFB, Emerging from Broken, has a Facebook page. So EFB, if you want to find you, is it at EFB? No, it's Emerging from Broken on Facebook, like it's emerging from broken again. There's a okay. button on the website too. So the professional page on Facebook is just called Emerging from Broken. Okay. It's very active. It has like 26,000 followers and it's that's, 30. That's, that right there tells you how much you're making a difference. That's fantastic. Congratulations. Yeah. So anybody listening, facebook.com slash Emerging from Broken. That's emerging as an ING. Emerging from Broken on Facebook. Like the page, engage in the conversation. This is great, Darlene. Uh, I want to thank you so much for joining us. And just remind everybody once again that's emergingfrombroken.com. And on Facebook, it's facebook.com slash emerging from broken. If you're looking to follow us or learn more about upcoming episodes, remember you can always go to datesafeproject.org. That's date, like you're going on a date, safe, you want to feel safe, and project, we're the ones working behind the scenes to make it happen for you. So datesafeproject.org, and if you want to go to my personal web page, blog page, you can go to todaysdiscoveries.com. That's with a plural S, todaysdiscovery.com, discoveries.com. Thank you, Darlene, again for joining us. We're so honored to have you on our show today. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. Oh, you're welcome. And for everyone listening, we look to seeing you next week, Thursday, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific time for Gift of Respect.